Hello and welcome to week two of the summer semester. Uh, today we're going to talk about early Virginia. And this is video one of two for this week. So look here. The first English attempt to colonize the New World go all the way back to 1580. Uh, specifically in 1584, a guy named Sir Walter Rowley. Uh, he's got the backing of Elizabeth the first the queen. Uh, he's going to finance a voyage to the coast of the United States, or what will become the United States. And he lands at a place called Roanoke Island. Uh, Roanoke Island, we often think of it as being in Virginia, but it was actually at the northern part of North Carolina along the outer bank. Now, this landing, it's just temporary. Uh, they're looking around, they're trying to decide if it's going to be a place to put a colony down. They decide, yes, the island's sufficiently fertile to support a settlement. And the voyage goes back to Britain. In 17, I'm sorry, 1587, three years later, a, an expedition has been put together and 117 settlers led by a guy named John White are going to land on Roanoke Island. There are men, there are women, there are children, they need to stay there. About a month after arriving, John White is going to go back to England. He's going to go there to get more supplies. But a war breaks out between England and Spain, and John White can't get back until 1590. Now, when John White gets back in 1590, he finds that the colony that he left is gone. It's not there anymore. And to this day, in 2021, we don't know what happened. Uh, there are a couple of different uh, ideas. Uh, there are a couple of different theories. One theory is that the people of Roanoke left the settlement. Nothing was left except for a tall fence built around the perimeter of the village and a single word inscribed on a fence post that said Croatoan. So there are thoughts that maybe the people tore down all the houses and then sailed further north. Another theory is that the Roanoke Island settlers were, set, were killed by disease uh, that doesn't work though because the thieves didn't take down the buildings. Uh, same thing with the theory about a severe storm or hurricane. The buildings were gone, but the fence was still there. Uh, the two most likely theories though are that the people of Roanoke decided to live with the natives. Uh, Croatoan, <clears throat> when I was carved in the post, that was the name of an island in the area, and it's possible and probably that the colonists decided to go live with the natives of the Croatoan. Uh, unfortunately, the Croatoan ethnic group has since died off, so there's no way to verify if there was any of the victims. And then last but not least, the uh, second most probable theory is that the colonists were killed by the Native Americans. Uh, there had already been a little bit of, of discomfort or disagreement between the settlers and the native people. So it's very possible that they were just killed. Now that does not stop England. In 1606, there's a new king in town and this new king is named James I. And James I is going to charter a joint stock company called the Virginia Company. Uh, basically the king sold shares of this company to wealthy investors to raise the money. And in exchange for the money, the king said, we will find gold, wine, citrus, olive oil, maybe even a Northwest Passage to China. So in 1607, three ships with 100 men are going to reach what is today Ch the Chesapeake Bay. They're going to find a river along the Chesapeake. They're going to sail 40 miles up the river that they can leave in the James River. 
and they're going to find a place that they will think looks good for a village. And this village becomes known as Jamestown. Now, when Jamestown is settled, um, it's going to be a fort. There are going to be some huts, a storehouse to keep everything they find, and a church. All the settlers are male. Most are either townsmen or what we would consider gentlemen. Nobody knew how to farm, and nobody would learn to farm either. Uh, they said they came to get gold, not farm. The leader, John Smith, who was actually supposed to be like a soldier of fortune, uh, he's going to take over control of Jamestown. And the settlers, led by John Smith, they're going to meet a group of natives known as the Powhatans. The leader of the Powhatans is known as Powhatan. And Powhatan was willing to talk to these settlers because um, he hoped to trade with the newcomers and he hoped to make an alliance with the newcomers so that they might be able to help him in his efforts to control other groups. Now, Smith is going to impose strict discipline on the colonists, and he's going to have a policy where he forces everybody to do labor. You don't work, you don't eat. Uh, to increase the supply, he bargained with the natives for some extra food, extra help. Uh, unfortunately for John Smith, though, in 1609, he suffers a gunpowder burn. It was bad enough that he was forced to return. And when Smith leaves, the discipline in the colony just falls apart. And the winter of 1609 going into 1610 is known as the starving time. Um, things get really rough. When the next boats come the following spring, in the spring of 1610, uh, it's found that only about 60 men are still alive. That's six years. All the poultry has been eaten, all the livestock has been eaten, and that does include the horses. And there are survivor reports, too. One survivor reported they were forced to eat dogs, cats, rats, and mice, and that they even dug up corpses and ate that, too. Another survivor talked about how a member of the colony murdered his wife, uh, who happened to be a native, uh, ripped the child out of her, and then threw it in the river, and then chopped the mother into pieces and ate her. Now, the new governor, Thomas Gates, is going to come to Virginia with instructions that the Indians should be forced to work for the colonists. And the colonists very quickly moved to see that those orders were carried out. And if the native groups did not give corn or furs to the colonists, the colonists burned down their buildings. Uh, Thomas Gates is also the person who established the laws of Virginia. And as you saw, those laws of Virginia were extremely harsh. Many things that you could do in the up in death. Ultimately, in Jamestown, it's going to survive. In 1618, the policy known as the Headright Policy begins. And basically, anyone could pay their way across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they were given 50 acres of land. And for each serpent that they could pay for a well, they got another 50 acres of land. So these wealthy planters, these wealthy Englishmen, are going to set up large farms that become known as a plantation in Virginia. The laws of Virginia are replaced with a new legal code, and this new legal code guarantees them the rights of any other Englishman, including assembly. The following year, in 1619, a ship is going to arrive with 90 women who were basically sold to their 
to the men for marriage. Then also in 1619, a Dutch ship brought 20 Africans to British North America, and those 20 Africans become the first slaves in the English colony. Now, the conditions were still very, very rough. Um, in 1622, the brother of Powhatan led an uprising that killed almost 400 settlers. Another attack happened in 1644. Also, by 1624, 14,000 people had come to the colony. But the death rate was so high that the population was only about 1,200 people. Now, in 1624, the king will dissolve the Virginia Company, and the Virginia Company will become a royal colony directly under control of the king. Now, Maryland, by the way, it's established at the same time. Maryland becomes a colony in 1634, and it's meant to be a colony for English Catholics who are subjected to discrimination in Europe. Now, both Maryland and Virginia are going to depend on tobacco as their main crop. Now, these colonies, Virginia and Maryland, are going to be made up of some of the most wealthy families in England. In fact, um, these are very big names in American history. The Byrds, the Carters, the Harrisons, the Lees, the Randolphs, the Taylors. Uh, it's something like one out of every five U.S. presidents can trace their ancestry back to one of these families. Around 1660, though, even wealthier people start coming to Virginia. And before you know it, Virginia is going to be this land of wealthy planters, and those with less wealth are going to be forced further south into what will eventually become the Carolina colony. Now, colonial control by 1650 was all about local politics. By 1650, Virginia had established a legislature to assist the royal governor in running the colony. And this was known as the House of Burgesses and the Governor's Council. The main purpose of this legislature was to enact taxes, to raise money. In reality, most Virginians had very little contact with this colonial government. Even fewer could participate because you had to be a white male landholder with a certain amount of money. So a lot of the day-to-day -day operation of the society fell to the county court. The county court, of course, they held trials because it's a court, but they also established the various duties or taxes that people owed to the government. Um, the county court also established the militia services. They built the roads, they built the bridges, and they built public buildings. Anglican Church, or the Church of England, it, there was a presence along with the Catholic Church, uh, but most people had little to do with the church in early Virginia. And that's because, not because they were anti-religion or anything, it's because there just weren't that many ministers or preachers. The churches were very, very few and far between because of the lack of ministers. Now, what was daily life like? Well, it's pretty lonely. Uh, the farms are big, and there aren't very many people. Going to church and going to court were the major social events of the day. The most important crop is tobacco, and that's the entire that the Virginia economy is based on. Everybody becomes involved in growing tobacco. Very few people grow food. And tobacco becomes cash when there's a shortage of gold and silver coins. There are very few women, and what women are there are in very high demand. 
And because there are so few women, there are very few unmarried women. Widows were allowed to remarry. They often remarried quickly. And because there were so few women, they could basically demand their price. They could hold out until a man offered them uh, what they were looking for. So they had a form of legal power and economic power just because you know, women are so scarce that they're more valuable. Now, population growth in Virginia is, is relatively slow, and that's just because of the high death rate uh, due to sickness, lack of food, lack of medical supplies, and a warmer climate. And slavery, even though it, it, the first slaves are brought to the New World, or I should say to British North America in 1619, it's really around 1640 that the slave trade is truly established. Now, the big reason for that has to do with indentured servitude. Um, before 1675, 75% of all labor in Virginia were indentured servants. Basically, indentured servitude, uh, somebody would pay your way to the New World and you would have to work off your debt before you could go free. Uh, how long that would be depended on your age and the time period. But three to seven years was usually the minimum. Now this is going to actually lead to something called Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. And this is a big reason why the slave trade takes over in Virginia. A lot of these indentured servants, when they became free, they were pretty poor and they felt like they were competing with Native Americans for places to live and land. The governor of Virginia in 1675 a man named William Berkeley, he was relatively friendly towards Native Americans. But that didn't work for these former indentured servants who have gained their freedom. And Nathaniel Bacon is going to become the leader of the rebellion. And Bacon's going to lead a mob to the city of Jamestown and he's going to try and kill Governor Berkeley. Well, Governor Berkeley, who had just got done saying that um, we should be nice and friendly to our Native American friends, is run out of town, and Bacon and his fellow rebels, uh, they go around and they start burning down Native American villains. Bacon and the colonists are going to issue the Declaration of the People of Virginia. And this is basically going to be a, um, a document that makes the rebellion official. They accuse Berkeley of irresponsibility and the failure to perform his duties as the governor of Virginia. Now, it looked like the rebellion was going to win, but Bacon ends up dying of dysentery later in 1676. When the next guy, John Ingram, takes over, he's not able to keep the rebellion together, and the rebel forces are going to be defeated by Berkeley, who eventually becomes the governor again. So what does all this do? What's the What's the outcome of this? Well, number one, Virginia and the colonies in general, they turn away from indentured servants and turn to African slavery. The indentured servants, they want political rights, and the wealthy aren't really able or willing to give back to them. The price of slaves starts to go down 
because there's such an increase in the number of slaves in the new world. And the rebels, all their property is taken away and somewhere between 20 and 25 rebels are actually hanged to prove a point. We also have to look at the Carolinas because the Carolinas are going to be a big part of this as well. We are a little bit later. Uh, 1663, King Charles II is going to give land away uh, to some people who helped him become king. And the Carolinas, because of this, are known as the Restoration Colony. Over in England, there was a brief period of time where the kings were overthrown and as a thank you for getting the crown back, King Charles is going to give the land to his friends. And because King Charles was restored to the monarchy, this is known as a restoration colony. Now, today we know it is North and South Carolina, but that was not always true. Uh, the southern part of Carolina colony around what is today Charleston, well, it was known as Charlestown originally, and that was the headquarters of North American slavery because it was so closely tied to the sugar trade. If you remember, sugar is what kept the slave trade going. The northern part of the Carolina colony was mostly former indentured servants. They have small independent farms. There was some slavery, but not nearly as much as you find in the southern part of the Carolina colony. The two parts of the Carolina colony, they start to um, drift apart, if you will. By 1712, it's decided to split the colony into two separate and independent colonies, the North Carolina colony and the South Carolina colony. All right, so you might be wondering where Georgia is. I have that with a different lecture. Um, You'll see that here in just a little bit. It goes along with a different type of colony. Um, remember, this is only the first of two videos for this week. So stay tuned, and we'll talk to you again in a few. Bye-bye.